you so much for joining me here at uh, sorry at um, the second of um, string of videos, the second one for Beta Earth 2.0 Kickstarter uh, announcement launch. Um, again, the Kickstarter will be launching on uh, I think it was December 25th, actually Christmas Day. That I'll be having that launch, um, and I did already introduce sort of what we're doing with this, um, sort of the the Kickstarter campaign, what the game's about. Um, sort of the cards in the game, the anatomy of them, um, and sort of deck construction for this game. That was all covered on that first video, so please, if you don't know any of that, please look at that first video. Um, but this one is where I'm coming back to actually show you how the game is played in detail. So you had, so, you get an idea, so that you can get an idea of how this works, um, how the game plays, and how that's going to really benefit you um, in understanding what, again, this is all about. So we're going to jump into it. This is a literal copy of uh, the exclusive game mat that's going to be offered on the Kickstarter here. Um, again, as part of what you can do for uh, one of the pledges. Again, this is something that uh, we're offering and allowing um, sort of get the hype going. See, it's, it's actually very beautiful art, incredibly beautiful art, and um, actually art from one of the cards uh, in the game. So we're going to just run through it. So as I mentioned, the Assuming you have a, um, a complete deck here, a constructed deck, um, all players are involved in that are going to bring their deck to the table with whatever deck they've constructed. Uh, first step for game setup is you're going to have this done at the same. Uh, first step is you're going to randomly determine who is the starting player. That can be determined randomly, however the group decides. Um, that's done first before you reveal anything, before you show anything. Just randomly decide in some way who goes first. Second part is this will be done at the same time. All players involved in the game will go through their, their constructed deck that they brought, and they're going to go through and grab. Uh, they're going to grab uh, any one location that they want. So for this deck, I'm going to go ahead and grab the vault, and you just put it into play in one of your location one of your location areas. And I wish it would stop getting all blurry. Sorry. Okay. So you're going to grab, pick a location from your deck. All of them are going to pick their location at the same time but not show it, and then they're all going to lay it down at the same exact time. So uh, you'll just lay it down, and that's the second step. Now, the players can have the exact same location. No location is unique. They're all non-unique cards. Um, what that just theoretically represents is that, again, these areas in general are very large areas, and so if you have two different players with a vault location that they start out with. It just means that in this very vast, large vault area, you've got two different areas where things are happening or occurring. So anyway, so it doesn't matter if they're duplicates. So everyone selects their location at the same time and then reveals at the same time the location will start with. They go into one of your two different location spots you can have during the game. That's step two of setup. Step three of setup is then Every player is going to go ahead and, again, reveal at the same time their chosen protagonist. And this deck is Kane. So you're going to put your chosen protagonist into your HQ, which is just located off to the left here. Uh, you're going to put into play your, again, your protagonist. You put them, and you can do it any way. You can have it this way, face up, for the game. If you prefer to have all the text there right up front, or if you prefer the picture and have that showing all the time, you can do it that way. But the point is, your protagonist will be in your HQ when you set up. Then, at this point, in player order, going clockwise with whoever the one who has initiative is, the one you chose to have the initiative who goes first, um, you're going to resolve all of your setup abilities, if any. There may be no setup abilities from, from protagonists. Uh, in this case, mine does have one. Uh, for and so Kane has a search and put into play a particular card. Uh, searching by itself is a keyword, which means you go through whatever your, the target is. Usually if they don't specify target, it's your play deck, your draw deck. Um, and you put that into your hand, reshuffle the draw deck. Um, so for Kane, his setup ability is search for tests and put into play at any location. And it's important in any location because that means that, that can be put at any location that's on the table, including 
an opponent's, not just Euro. But let's assume I want to shore up mine. So let's assume I'm the first player. I would do mine first. So again, it says search for a test and put it in play at any location. I'm going to choose this one. And then you fire off any keywords. Uh, this game, she has a keyword of inhabit AI. I won't go into a lot of detail. That's covered very specifically in the rule book. But it's another keyword that has a very specific effect. Um, what that means basically is it's going to be search for a card that carry that has the trait outlined in the keyword. So for this keyword, it's inhabit AI. That means I'm going to search the deck for a card that has the AI in the traits. And then you're going to go ahead and immediately search and put into play like I did with the setup ability. But it's with that inhabit ability. So I found an AI card. I searched my deck. And I'm going to put that AI card into play and then immediately attach the card that triggered that, the inhabit card, and equip it to the card that you searched for based on, again, that, that inhabit keyword. At this point, um, this is now considered the host, and the inhabit card is considered to be inhabiting that host um, or equipped uh, in just general terms. Um, but anyway, so that's resolving the setup ability. Every player will do that uh, until all players have resolved any setup abilities that may or may not be there. Once that's all done, then the final step of setup is this will be done simultaneously, again, with all the players. You're just going to shuffle your draw deck and draw the cards up to your beginning hand size, or your standard hand size. Um, normally in the game, that's seven. You may be bigger, depending on other cards that may be in play from other setup abilities, other things like that. Um, but standard is 7. So, doing that. Uh, I'm going to give it one more good shuffle. Now, something I need to say right away is um, having some kind of a play mat with designated areas is not needed. That's just a nice bonus feature for uh, if you do that pledge uh, that includes it, or if you add it as an add-on, if you're not doing the full, all three levels of the pledge. Um, it's just a nice thing, sort of the idea of where things go. Technically, you can do it on any board, and you, as long as you know where things go. Anyway, so this is going to go there, roughly. I'm going to draw the seven cards. And that is that. And I'm just going to put these in a particular order for my own personal reference. I didn't get a single location. I got nothing but allies. I'm probably going to want a mulligan because it's never going to have nothing but allies. All right, but that is it. I did my setup ability. That's done. We are good. Everyone's in setup. Setup is done. So now let's get to the actual gameplay. The game is going to be made up of player turns, and every player is going to run through their turn until it gets to the end of it. Then we go to the next player and just go keep going around until someone achieves victory. Um, I already outlined this, but I will re-mention this. So a victory in this game is to be the first to reduce all opposing opponents. And usually in a one versus one game, it's just the opponent. Um, but if you reduce all opposing endurances to zero, a war be the first to reach 20 victory points. So again, reduce all opposing endurances to zero, or be the first to reach 20 victory points. That's how you win the game. So let's start assume again, I had the initiative. Usually what's going to be helpful is to have some kind of a counter to show who has the initiative. If it's a multiplayer game, if it is um, a one-on-one -on -one game, it's a little, easier, a little easier to keep track of initiatives. You may not need anything to mark anything. Um, and then you're going to want to have a counter for your life and a counter for uh, a way to count up all the victory points that you get. Another counter that might be helpful is to keep track of how many allies you've played in a turn, and that's because there's something known as an ally limit, both in playing of allies and having allies in play. And I'll go over that when we get to the, this, the main phase where we talk about things that you can do, actions. But that's about it. So just to go through my example here that I just mentioned. So we are going to go with the two counters that I mentioned. Okay. 
and you can put these wherever you want when you're doing your game, obviously. Uh, there's no one right way to do it. So I'm going to use this counter for my health. Again, every player starts with 20 endurance. So there's my 20 endurance. I'll just put it below my HQ next to my hero there. And then I have a zero on victory points. I'll just put this below my destroyed pile over here or somewhere close there, probably more like the corner over here. Okay. Okay. So I've got that, and then I'm going to have a die here, like I said, that I'm just going to be able to keep track of how many allies I've played in a given turn. Um, and you can use any die for that. I'm probably going to use a die here. Not that either. Um, and use just some kind of a, a large die to keep track of things, probably. Um, so I'm going to use this die here. Um, actually, no. I'm going to use that for a different reason, which I'll talk about later. So, let me just do this. It's a lot. I need something that's not that. Okay. So I'm going to just use this die to keep track. Um, and each, after each ally I play, I'll count down from the three, and that will be an easy way to keep track of everything. So I'll keep this to the side. I just I can actually put it down there, um, and that's it. Um, actually, there's one other thing I am going to do, and you might you can just keep track of damage as you take it by putting counters for the damage, or you can do what I like to do, which is taking one of these die eights. Uh, and just using that to track health, so I'm just putting it over there just to keep track. So we've got Amadeus with four health. Anyway, so that's just ideas of counters and dies you can use to keep track of things if you need to. Um, but now, we're, like I said, we're going to go into the actual gameplay. So when it's your turn, the first you have four phases. Like I said, the first phase is the prep phase. Now what you do on the prep phase, first thing is, if you have any exhausted cards, all of your exhausted cards will ready. Um, so these are readied cards because they are in the uh, horizontal 90 degree position. So that is where they are. Um, if it's ever exhausted, that's the term when you're doing something that requires a lot of time to do an action, you exhaust it um, and then that is going to be turning it this way you know, turning it, rotating it 90 degrees so that it is, uh, you know, upright is readied, uh, rotated 90 degrees, this way horizontally is exhausted. So again, anything exhausted, you will ready. That's the first step of the main phase. Then the second step of the main phase is you'll go ahead and score victory points at any and all locations that you control. As you can see, this one has a victory point total. Um, let me just bring this up here so that I don't cause any issues here. So this victory point total is 5. So that means that it, during this step, the second step of the prep phase, I am going to score 5 victory points. So I'll do that right now. So I'm going to go ahead and take this. I'm going to move the dial up to 5. So I have scored five victory points. Again, that's the second step. If I had two, I'd score whatever that total was for victory points. So you score victory points at locations you control. That's the second start, second step of the prep phase. Then the third and final step of the prep phase is you're going to discard any and all cards you don't want to keep in your hand and redraw up to your current hand size. So I think I'm going to go ahead and discard Soldier Corsair. Um, um, hmm. I think actually, and I'm going to discard my second soldier. Yeah, I think. So we want to do. Now I'm going to keep the other soldier. Okay, so I'm going to discard two cards. 
So I will discard those two cards into my discard pile, and then draw up to my hand size, which is seven, which means I'm going to draw two more cards. And unfortunately, I only got one location, so this is not a great example. Okay. So I've done my, my final step of the prep phase. Now we go to the main phase. And this is where the meat or the juice or the, the real body of the game play takes place. So now that we're at the main phase, the main phase, um, we can do one of many different actions. And the way it works is this is the only time during a player turn where in all players in the game have an opportunity to act. Um, unless the one universal exception is instant effects as can be played at any time by any player, you know, at any moment, because they are like interrupts. All right, or any ability that says at any time, that's treated as an instant. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and just sort of lay out the groundwork here. So I think what we're going to do, all right, so yeah, okay. Alrighty, so what we're going to do here is uh, look at actions here. Now, on the first main phase of the game, there's one restriction. No combat actions may be initiated. So you can't initiate any combat actions on the first phase of the main, of the first main phase of the game. No one can initiate combat. So we'll get to that as the last thing to outline in the gameplay here. So, uh, what you do is, first of all, is you can play a card from your hand. Um, now, this is not referring to instant effects. Instant effects don't count against your taking an action for that main phase. Um, as I mentioned just a second ago, they're like interrupts. They're just going to happen, resolve the effects, discard the card, the instant card effect, and then just go on with doing the action if you haven't taken one yet, for or passing if you don't want to take an action at that moment. So let's do playing cards for what would count as playing a card. So one of them is you can play an ally. So let's say I wanted to play Epitomus Rex. And I wanted to sort of secure as best I could, uh, sort of spread out the board to try and to secure his location. So let's assume that he's got his location out here. I'm just going to keep it in view here. So I'm going to put him there, at, assuming that my opposing location is there, opposite me or opposite each other on the table. So I'm going to play that to that location. When you play an ally, you can play it to any location. You just announce you're playing an ally, say the name, and put it into play. That's playing an ally. So I played Epitomus Rex. I would just keep track of that. So I'd go down to two, or keep track that I've got two allies left to play that I can play that turn. So that's my playing a card that way. Uh, another way that you can play a card is if you're going to play a location putting it into play for its ongoing location effect. So, and that means that you would just announce I'm playing a location into play. Um, so you would announce it, put it into your second location spot, and like that, and that would be playing a card, in a card from your hand. So, and then you'd have the ongoing effect. So that is an example of playing a card. So it's playing an ally or playing a location into play for its ongoing effect. Those would be the two examples of the playing a card action. So that would be one. Another one that you can do is using a card ability. Um, card abilities are going to be just things that in the text says that you can do. Um, and if it's not combat specific, you can do it at this time outside of combat. Um, or if it's, you know, not tied to directly to the moment of combat. Um, so, for example, Amadeus has a card ability. It says I can discard a card to cause my opponent to discard the top four cards of their deck. So, I am going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to discard my Counselor, because it says discard a card to do that, so I'm going to do that. So, we'll discard a card, and that will go ahead and cause that to cause him to discard the cards from his hand. So that is an example of using a, a discard cards from his deck, I'm sorry. 
So that is an example of using a card ability. That is one action that you can take. Another one is equipping a card to another card or vice versa, meaning equip or unequip. So I'll cover equipping. Um, and I did cover my card that covered the card anatomy uh, in the first video. You'll know what that is. Um, but basically, if you equip a card, what you're going to do is either from your hand onto a card that you're equipping it to, or at the same location that a card is already present with. So what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, that this Corsair was already here at this location, and I wanted to take an equip action. Uh, no, because she's... Oh, technically I could do that because it's a ship. So let's not do the ship example because that's just, um, it has its own rules involved with equipping. Um, well, no, it, you still get the same idea across. Normally, I'll say this, normally an ally is going to have a limit of one card that you can have equipped to it at any given time. So Tess, for example, is equipped to Amadeus. Normally that would be the cap. Normally that would be the limit. Starships have an example. Uh, starships have the exception. Um, those starship cards, you can put more on there. They just can't count for equipping bonuses to that ship. Um, so, but let's just go with the standard example because I want to make this as understandable as possible. So let's assume, we're going to go back. So let's say I did play that. We're just going to go with the examples that we've done so far. So let's say I've played that. He did something, comes back to me. Now, let's say I've played Epitomus Rex there instead. Um, so that was my first, you know, minion, let's say, for example. Let's say I played it there instead of over there after playing this. So let's go back to the equip options. So here's where I can equip. So, actually, no, to make this fully functional, we're going to do this. So let's assume that this is the setup when I have the option to equip. We've got these two guys here at the Deserted Planetoid. I've got the Amadeus equipped with Tess at the vault. So let's go through the examples here. So uh, the first way to equip is you can equip from what's already at the location onto another. So if I wanted to make Epitomus Rex to have a little more combat ability in combat, I can say I'm equipping and I'm going to take the Corsair, slide it underneath Epitomus Rex like that, like you see there. And now Epitomus Rex will have that equip bonus Equip that bonus to his combat equal to the equip value of that card. So in this case, equip value is 2. So he will have a plus 2 attack and defense in combat. In other words, plus 2 combat um, because of the equip. But that's how you one way you can equip. Another way you can equip is, let's say Epitomus Rex was alone at that location. I can uh, equip from my hand directly. So I could say, I'm going to equip this Corsair. I can just say it's in my hand, I'm going to equip it. You would just directly from your hand slide it underneath Epitomus Rex like that, and he's equipped. So those are the two different ways that you can equip. Is an equip action or is an equip action you can actually unequip. And to unequip, you would go ahead and take the Corsair, say I'm unequipping the Corsair from the Epitomus, from Epitomus here, and then you would just slide it out, and they have to come out onto the same location that the that the card they're equipped to is at. So I can't do, for example, I can't unequip here and pop him over to another location. He has to come out into wherever the uh, wherever the person is that he's coming out of. So if I unequipped the Corsair in this scenario, say they're already there, I would come off like this, and that would be an unequip action. So that is an example, like I said, of equip or unequip. So that again is an action you can do. So just to recap, so far you can play a card from hand, you can use a card ability, or you can equip a card or unequip a card. Then the next thing you can do for an action is you can sacrifice a card. Now we already talked about equip values. Again that's if they equip to something else then that comes into play. This value here is your sacrifice value. That is effective if you sacrifice. Now you can, just like equipping, um, with different ways to do it, sacrifice is one way, but there's different things you can do when you sacrifice. So if you sacrifice a card, um, I forgot to, forgot to, um, no, we're good. 
So if you sacrifice a card, let's say I'm going to sacrifice Epitomus Rex, then I would go ahead and announce I'm doing that, and then I would go ahead and destroy the card I'm sacrificing. It would then, you would then go ahead and immediately resolve what you're sacrificing for. So the first option for sacrificing a card is if you sacrifice it, you're going to go ahead and you put that value, sacrifice value, towards claiming the initiative for the next turn. Um, if you do that, you'd, and you didn't, if you do that, you'd want to keep track of that total with some kind of die, with some kind. Um, so let's say I did that. Uh, let's say I did want to go ahead and you know try to secure the initiative for the next turn. Then let's say I did destroy him. Then you can always just keep track of it with some die or something. So let's just put that there. There's what I've got for this turn for my sacrifice value. So I'd sacrifice and just keep track of that. And then we're going to go ahead and get to where this comes into play later in the turn. But that is one way or one use of sacrificing a card. The other thing you can do when you sacrifice a card is you can go ahead and again announce you're sacrificing, but just say instead of sacrificing for initiative, you can say I'm sacrificing for uh, for cycling cards, for card cycle. So if you do that, you're going to go ahead and take any four cards, because his value is four, his sacrifice value. So you would go ahead and be able to sacrifice any four cards. Uh, I'm sorry, you'd be able to cycle any four cards from your discard pile. Um, and then they would be destroyed. Since I only had three in my discard pile, if I did that, that would be all of those cards. And they would be cycled. And cycled means it goes to the bottom of your draw deck. So if I'd sacrificed for that to cycle cards, that's what would happen. So again, that is another option. You can sacrifice cards. I mean, you can sacrifice a card for card cycling. All right. So that is, that is sacrificing a card. So that is, again, something else you can do. And it's blurring up again. I am so sorry. Let me get this to focus. There we go. All right, so again, oh, come on. I'm sorry, this thing is not functioning the way it's supposed to. There we go, oh my gosh, okay. So that is another option, like I said, is sacrificing a card, that is an action. So it is an action, you have to do that as an action on your turn, or on during the main phase, whether it's during your turn or opponent's turn. So that is uh, sacrificing. The other action you can do is it called a transfer. To transfer, you do need to exhaust a card that you're transferring. If you transfer the card, let's say I wanted to move forces from one location to another, you can do that. Let's say I want to move Epitomus, and he's already there. Let's say I want to move him to an opponent's location. I would announce that. Let's say I'm doing a transfer with Epitomus. So you go and exhaust and then move to the location you want to move it to. So I would, in this case, exhaust, move, let's, again, assuming that up here is the, again, opposing location. So I'd go ahead and move it to my opponent's location. That's one way to transfer. Another way to transfer involves the HQ and your protagonist. So the protagonist can transfer as well. So if you want to transfer the protagonist, you would just announce, uh, if they're in the HQ, you would just exhaust and then move them to the location you want them to be at. So you'd move them, let's say I wanted to reinforce Epitomus, I could move them there. That would be a transfer from the HQ to a location. And then you can vice versa with the protagonist. Let's say he's on the board already, you want to move him back, you want, say he's on the board, and you want to move him back to the HQ. So you can go ahead and exhaust and move him back to the HQ. So those are the ways for transferring, and that's what you can do for a transfer. Again, an ally from location to location, or a protagonist from HQ to location, or from location to HQ. And that, again, is an action. So that is another action you can take. So again, as a recap, you have play a card from hand, use a card ability, equip a card to another card, or vice versa, Sacrifice a card, transfer a card, and then the last action you can take is you would go ahead and you can initiate a battle. Again, on the first 
round of the game, that's not a possibility. But let's jump into it. So how do battles work in this game? So I'm going to just take some examples, and we're just going to run through it. So let's assume that we had uh, let's assume we had some decent numbers here. We're going to just go through. Let's just go with this as an example. Actually, we'll just we'll face off with these two. Okay, so we're going to take this as an example. These two. So let's say these are my opponent's forces, and they're attacking me here at the planetoid. So to initiate combat at a location. You're going to go ahead and choose who's initiating that, and you're going to exhaust them and announce the combat. So I'm going to say the Corsair is going to initiate. He's going to exhaust. So we'll do that. He's going to exhaust. Then the opponent, and I am announcing that, uh, who the target is. So I'm going to and exhaust. I'm going to announce that my target is going to be, uh, let's say, the soldier. So, at this point, as our immediate response to the initiated combat, he can either let the soldier be the target, um, or he can throw uh, the enforcer in front by exhausting and saying that that's who is going to, you know, be engaged with the combat. Then at this point, it would go back to me, and then I would be able to decide who I'm bringing in. So let's say, though, that he was okay with that, and he said, okay, fine. And so he did go ahead and let me attack the soldier as the target. If he does that, if he does not throw someone in front, the one who's being targeted in combat will be exhausted regardless. So, so they're going to exhaust their character that, again, was the target of the combat. So we're going to exhaust the soldier. So that's what we're going to do. So that's what happens, and then, so that happens and goes to me, and I want to try and beat, so I'm going to go ahead and exhaust Epitomus Rex, and actually, technically, I wouldn't have even started with the scenario because I don't have a lot to fight with. So, anyway, so I'm going to just slide this over just so you can get a general idea here. Okay, so I'm going to exhaust Epitomus Rex as joining the, the combat as a combatant. At this point, it goes back to the participant. I mean, back to that player. And so, at this point, he can go ahead and let the Enforcer join by exhausting to join the combat, or he can just say pass. If he passes, it goes back to me in this little mini-combat exchange, and then I'd be able to use a com use a game ability that's combat specific, you know, or play some other card that allowed me to do something. And then, you know, but why would you not want to throw everybody in? I'll tell you why. And this is why. So let's assume he wanted to take the more risky route. So he decides, no, nah, we're just we're gonna go ahead and actually no, we're gonna go back here. No, we'll just keep going. So he decides not to join. He passes. He goes back to me. And I say, okay, I will pass. So he passes. Uh, sorry, I pass, goes back to him, and then he, he has a chance to now do something or pass again. So whether it's in the combat exchanges or in the main phase itself, a passing does not forego you being able to do something for the rest of that combat or main phase. Passing only ends things if... It is the final pass of a, all players passing consecutively. That's the only time it ends that combat and or the main phase. So, he, so I passed, went back to him. Like I said, he could choose to pass and end the combat, uh, or end the this part of combat, or he can, again, do something. He's going to pass, and I'll show you why he would maybe want to do that. So, he does go ahead... And he passes, so we both pass consecutively. This part of combat's over. So we've done abilities, uh, we've, we've engaged who's going to engage. Now we go to the comparing totals in combat. Now, this is a total scenario, so you're going to look at all totals. So the uh, soldier is a 2 2, 2 attack, 2 combat. My stats is going to be the Corsair is a 2 attack, and Epitomus is a 1 attack, so the total is 3. You attack 
and you compare stats in this way in this order. You attack, compare the attacker versus the defender's defense, and then you compare the defender's attack versus the attacker's total defense. So again, I'm three versus two. The difference is one. I'll throw one, we'll be assigning one damage to the soldier. So uh, we'll resolve that though when we compare totals, after we, we both compare totals. So then they compare mine, that's a two versus my defense of two, one and one. So two versus two is nothing. So I will take, so there'll be no damage assigned on, to me as the attacker. So we've compared totals, now we assign damage. So again, nothing to me. There was a difference of one. So this soldier would take one damage and that is gonna cause that to go to a zero. At that point in combat, then you're gonna go ahead and look at if there are any combat triggers that would be initiated. So before you remove casualties, um, again, you keep track of things by, um, what I like to do is have these dice on there and then when it's gone, removing it. But you can do it any way you want. Uh, you can just throw little tokens there for damage, whatever you prefer to do it. Because damage in this game is persistent. So it will stay on until that ally is discarded from being knocked out or until they heal. So damage will persist. So they're going to be discarded, but we resolve the next part. And this is the main draw of this combat in this game is something known as combat triggers. So here's the reference card that you'll get in the game. It outlines uh, all the phases if they would just focus. There we go. So it outlines again all the phases of a turn, but on the back it outlines here all of the combat triggers. Or yeah, the combat triggers. Now there are four different ones. You've got Overload, counter, press, and outwit. Those combat triggers are things that you can trigger by having the right keywords, um, just from having them involved in combat. So again, you compare totals after you complete uh, actions and engagements with and choosing who engages. After that's all done, you compare totals, then you go to assign damage, which we've done, then you go to combat triggers. Combat triggers, um, you look at any of the appropriate keywords. Again, the reference card will tell you. So for the overload, uh, it tells you right they're activated by energy manipulation. Um, again, counter is by fighting, uh, press is with strength, and outwit is with intellect. So in this case, um, we have intellect. He does have that present. So I can trigger off that ability if I was successful in my attack. If, and the way you gauge if you're successful is not by how much damage you do, it's from that initial uh, comparison of stats. So that comparison was a difference of one. I had three, the defense was two. So the difference is one. So I will be able to trigger the combat ability, which in this case, since I have, again, the intellect, allows you to do it for outwit which means he's going to discard cards from his hand, starting with the hand, and discard equal to X, which is the difference between the attack and defense there. So he would end up discarding card out, you know, activate that combat trigger, and he would go ahead and discard a card. Now, combat triggers are not simultaneous. Damage assigning is simultaneous, have to compare totals, but combat triggers are not. he will go ahead and do you resolve your combat triggers first, whoever initiated the combat, and then the one who are the targets of the attack, the defenders, will initiate any if they had any combat triggers that were resolved. So he discard a card, then we'd go ahead and discard anyone who was knocked out. So I would survive, the soldier would be discarded, they'd move to that player's discard pile. So that is what would happen there. Um, actually, yeah, actually, bef before I do that, I would actually have an option because of an ability to play any kind of instant effect or combat trigger at this point. Um, but we'll just, we'll assume we didn't and we just resolve. I'm just trying to give you a basic idea here. Now, that would end that combat. Then we'll go back to an action. And at this point, uh, he would be able to, my opponent would be able to take an action. As you can see, there's a location where I've got exhausted characters. 
and we have um, yes yeah, so we've got exhausted characters and you have uh, an, 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 an unexhausted character so you can hit face on your opponent if you have unopposed if you're not opposed at a location and it's different from control control means like this control means again I there are no opposing characters at this location so I control it which would give me the victory points hitting face your opponent's face or hitting their endurance directly does not require it to be uncontrolled it just requires that there be no opposition in this case everybody here is exhausted so that means that he this enforcer can do an attack that's unopposed hit face so basically at this point it goes we completed the combat that I initiated it goes to him he decides to initiate combat on his end so he's going to for in this example exhaust the enforcer and do an attack at me at face there's no one to block so I would take damage equal to the total attack in this case it's one so I would go down one on my endurance to 19 and I would just mark it so I would go down to 19 endurance that resolve that combat so that in a nutshell is combat again you're looking at combat triggers uh, comparing stats uh, you know moving uh, casualties and you're just going to go through that kind of that's the combat process so I hope that was clear if it's not please feel free to ask questions in the comments I'm more than happy to answer those uh, but that's combat so we're gonna go ahead and just assume that all was done there's nothing else um, let's assume that it came to me and I decided to pass uh, and then let's say he decided to pass and that ended that main phase so let's assume everyone passed once everyone passes consecutively just like if both if all people involved in combat pass consecutively in combat just like that if all players in a turn or all players in a game pass consecutively in a main phase it ends that phase in the player turn so he's going to go ahead and that ends that we now go to the next the third of four phases which is the cleanup phase now the cleanup phase the first thing you're going to do is just two things the first is Dis discard access allies now I mentioned earlier that acts that ally limit again it's twofold so it's the limit of playing three allies in a turn but also there is a limit of three allies at a given location by the time you hit this phase so during the turn you can put it down you can have present uh, you know during the accumulation of turns you know more than three in a given moment at a location however again if you have more than three when you hit that phase you're going to go ahead and discard down to three now normally it's not going to happen a lot because of the way things work and with that alley limit for playing them as well that's not going to happen a lot but that could happen and the reason I say that is there are some cards and effects that allow you to buy to get more out than your standard card play function for example the enforcer here says that may be played from hand at any time, aka like an interrupt. So he doesn't count against your ally limit of, of ally limit of playing allies in a turn because he plays at any time, like an instant. So let's say, for example, let's say someone attacked me, you know, and they were involved in the combat. And let's say there were already three people. Let's say these three were already there. I had them all join. And then I decided to go ahead and play this as an instant during the turn. And then we went to passing ending phases. Let's say I took no casualties. And let's say we ended the phase. And this is how we are at the cleanup phase. There are four allies at this location. So I'd have to discard one. In that case, I'd probably go ahead and discard the escort. And that would be discarded, and that would maintain the limit of three at the location. So again, discard access allies. That's what you would do. So, uh, discard access allies. Whoops. So, discard access allies. That's the first part of your prep phase. Uh, I'm sorry, of your cleanup phase. Then, at the end of the end of the cleanup phase, so the second part of that is you draw one card. 
So you would just draw a card from the top of the deck. And then that ends the cleanup phase. And then finally the last phase is pass initiative. And this point is where this comes into effect. So at this point, normally you would pass the initiative to the next player. However, if anyone sacrificed for initiative, then you would need to compare initiative uh, that sacrifice value. So if whoever sacrificed the greatest in total sacrifice value for those who sacrificed to, to gain the initiative, whoever sacrificed the most in value gains the initiative. So that's something to keep in mind. But if there were no players that sacrificed for initiative, then it would just go to the next player clockwise in a one versus one game, it would just go to the opponent. And you would just switch off like that, again, unless there's any sacrificing for, you know, initiative. But if that's the case, if, again, no sacrifice occurred, again, just goes to the next person. And that is how you end your turn, by, sac by again, passing the initiative. So that is, in a nutshell, that is, again, how you play a turn. I know this was a little bit lengthier, but I wanted to make sure that it was clear um, as clear as possible for, again, giving you a general idea of how the game works. Um, when you know how the game works and you, and you know what you're doing, the games can go fast. Um, and there's a lot of fun interaction to be had. There will be moments where people sort of take their time to be a little more strategic. Because if you've noticed from this run through, there definitely there is there are moments where you want to be as strategic as possible. And it's kind of like a chess game in that regard sometimes, uh, in a lot of ways. So you want to be you know aware of, again, multiple factors, but again, it can go pretty quick. Um, so I hope I covered everything. So that again, that is uh, the game. Again, um, really this sort of highlights things with the combat triggers. Um, just two things to note, if you're doing attack face to the opponent, um, you know, hitting their endurance directly, then again, you don't ever fire off combat triggers. Combat triggers are only used in, a, in combat where there is opposition. That's the only time that that is valid, and you have to have those keywords present and be successful with the attack. Uh, any attack uh, is still considered successful if it hits face, um, regardless of being able to play combat triggers or not. Because there are other cards that may play off in later sets down the road uh, that say if you know combat was successful or whatever, they do something. Now, let's cover one aspect of combat I didn't cover, and that is, let's say that... Um, I had my, you know, let's say that my antagonist, oh, sorry, that's a future set, I'm sorry. So let's say that my protagonist was at a location by himself. And let's say that he was being opposed by, let's say just there was a full group here. Let's just bring these in. So let's say he was being opposed by, you know, um, the soldier, Pinamus, and the Corsair. So let's say that there was this combat that initiated and I just had my my uh, protagonist there. Um, and let's say that they're successful uh, in doing an attack, that their attack is successful. Um, so what would occur in that scenario, uh, unlike allies where you take damage and remove casualties, um, there's no removing of a protagonist from the game into the discard pile normally because they're the main hero. They don't have a health bar. They have a total endurance that you as the player have. So instead, if the attack was successful and, you, and there's any you know damage to face that's done, uh, or damage done to the endurance, then you would exhaust, well, they'd be exhausted from the combat, sorry. Let me go back, sorry. Sorry about the cut, let me just double check here. Let me just go back and explain. So let's cover the different scenarios. So if this were the case, the attack was made. So let's say he uses the core, the soldier to initiate the combat. Then I have no one there. So I've got to intact uh, Kane. So I would exhaust Kane. There we go. Now, as you notice, this combat's going to be different because there are, there's no health bar he has. There's rather a player's endurance, which is represents both his physical health, so any endurance in the game, unlike health on allies, uh, endurance represents several things. It represents both the physical stamina and capability of taking damage that the protagonist has, but also 
their collective resources involved in the fight. They represents both of those things. So, um, as a result of not having an endurance and not having a health bar, rather this endurance value, what would occur if the attack is successful is first of all, any successful attack that where damage would be inflicted is going to hit reduce the endurance. It's a, it's going to act the same as again hitting face with an exception. This is not unopposed combat. So because the combat's not unopposed, there will be the ability to fire off. Uh, combat triggers, both from the protagonist end as a defender uh, and from their end as the attacker. So you will still be able to, even though damage is going to hit the endurance from taking damage if the attack is successful against my protagonist in this scenario, um, you will still be able to fire, again, fire off um, combat triggers because it's not an unopposed, you know, attack. So you would have the, you know, so you'd have the endurance loss, you'd fire off the combat triggers. Um, now what occurs with that as well is if the attack was successful, um, and they're the only ones there, again, to take any kind of damage, uh, and the attack is successful in this scenario, they would also be sent back to the HQ. So you'd resolve the damage, the combat triggers, and, um, uh, pop them back to HQ. So they would go back to the HQ in that scenario. Um, so that's how combat is slightly different if there is only a protagonist in the combat. That's the one sort of difference. If you have only a protagonist involved in combat, there's going to be some slight differences. But again, I just had to point those out. Um, but, you know, if, if essentially the essentials are the same, whether it's a, you know, a protagonist or an ally. All right, the other thing I need to cover here is something known as the paradox rule. So the paradox rule is going to be this. Um, okay, so the protagonist rule is going to be this, and that is that, I mean, not protagonist rule, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, paradox rule, I'm sorry. The paradox rule is if any players share the same named unique card, as being in play and on the table, whether it's an HQ or at a location, then there's going to be a paradox effect. And that means that all players who are contributing to that paradox, meaning you are one of the players that has a copy of that unique card in play, then at the end of any player turn where that paradox is in effect, those players again are who are again contributing to the paradox will discard the top card of their draw deck at the end of the turn. So you would discard, for example, let's say he had Kane or Tess or Amadeus in play, uh, and it's the end of my turn. He and I would both discard the top card of our draw deck into the discard pile. That is the paradox effect. The moment that you know any of the contributing factors are lost or discarded, removed from play or destroyed, uh, and there's no longer you know multiple copies of the unique card in play, the paradox effect is ended. Um, so I just had to bring that up as well. Um, but that's it. Um, that's sort of the run through of the game. I hope that that was clear. Hope that gets you excited for uh, again the all the really huge endless possibilities with this game and with everything that we plan to do with this game as we move forward, uh, making expansions and and really expanding on this game as it goes along. So I appreciate your time. Um, let me go back to the. Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, camera here really quick. Thank you for, all, for joining me again for that run-through. I really appreciate your time, but I hope that gave you a good idea of, again, how the game plays, the, the, the functionality of the core mechanics. Um, I tried to go as quickly as possible, but I wanted at the same time, at the same time, I wanted to take my time so that you understood, so you could see how it goes and, and how it's played and really see the depth of the gameplay. There's a lot of nuance to it. Um, but yet it's just simple enough to really be engaging and to leave a lot of room for strategy and gameplay and how you play the game and customization. So, again, thank you so much for watching. And, again, I'll see you guys at the Kickstarter when this launches. Again, I think I'm pretty sure it's going to be December 25th, Christmas Day, when this starts. Um, and it'll be running um, for... Um, 
up through January 25th of 2024. Um, and just, we definitely want to get the word out, get people excited about this, because it'll be a very good game. And we're excited about it, like I said. So thank you again for joining Buck. This is a Buck with the Review and Book Quick Productions. Hope you have a great night, and we'll see you later. Bye.